So um, let's get started with um, the message and um, what I want to talk to you about this morning is um, on how to stay focused. And um, we live in a day and age where you, you are so distracted with everything around you that it's almost humanly impossible for you to stay focused on what you're supposed to stay focused on. You, you and I have to learn and to develop. We're supposed to be focused on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to set our affection on things above. We need to look the, at the things that are not seen because the things that are seen are temporal. We, you and I, as children of God, we have to set our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and on the word of God. We live in a world today, in a society today, where everything around this, everything in this world is leading your mind astray. Everything in this world is trying to distract you from keeping a relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything in this world is pulling you away from Jesus Christ. Everything in this world is turning your heart, your mind, and your eyes away from Jesus Christ. The devil has this world set up so systematically that he has every detail and every aspect connected where he's just trying to distract your mind where it becomes almost impossible for you or I to stay focused on what we are to stay focused on. Now I want to think about this because I believe one of our main distractions is technology and I believe that one of our main distractions is right there. Amen. Now I want you to think about this just a hypothetical can you imagine if you treated your Bible like your cell phone? We'd be like, where's my, where's my cell phone? I mean, I see people, you see little kids, the mom takes the cell phone away from them, and what do they do? Ah, I need my phone. And they're, cry, they're going crazy. Why? It's because what that phone has projected in them and what that phone does to them, but the adults would do the same thing. Maybe not the tears and all, but if somebody had come up to you and said, hey, I'm taking your phone, you'd have a fit. What about people leaving their Bibles in church? I go downstairs and we got a stack of Bibles. And I'm like, how does people leave their Bible here? If you were to treat your Bible like you treated your cell phone. So every time you pick up your cell phone, I want you to pick up the Bible. Every time you read something on the internet, uh, Instagram, whatever it is, tick knock, nick knock, patty whack, and all that other junk, right? <laughs> whatever it is, you pick up that Bible and you read something. And every time you want to post something, you imagine if you posted some scripture, could you imagine, right, every time that you reached for your phone, before you reach for your cell phone, reach for the very living word of God. Could you imagine if we live like that? Could you imagine like the impact we would have in the world? Could you imagine the impact that the Spirit of God would have in our lives? That if, if we thought about the Bible, if we meditated on the Word of God, if every time we reached for our cell phone, we reached for the pages of Scripture, and every time we opened up to scroll, we were scrolling through the living Word of God. Could you imagine how, how strong we would be? Could you imagine how strong our faith would be? Could you imagine how strong you would be in the word of God? That if every time you reach for the phone, you reach for the living word of God. I want you to think about that just for a few moments. So much of us, we have, man, we've got this and this and all of our phone. You know what all it is? It's nothing more than a distraction. The devil wants to occupy your mind. You guys understand that, right? He wants to occupy your mind with anything in the world. He wants to keep you so focused on this world that you can't see the kingdom of God. He wants you to keep stay so focused on the here and the right now and the temporal that you don't turn your affection towards the eternal. He wants to keep you so preoccupied that when you die and you stand before God, you won't even have any answers. He wants to keep you so occupied in this realm that we live in. You ever think about it? Guys, we're not going to be here for a long time. The Bible says your life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then what? It just vanishes away. Job says man's life is like sparks of a fire. They just go up, and then it vanishes away. You don't know when your number will come up. You don't even have any idea how frail your life is. You don't. I went to the, to the um, where, where are my guys? Where are they? Oh, where's, right here. Um, they set up a suicide prevention. 
And we went there, and it was great. These guys did a great job for their friend. Some of you young people don't even know how frail life is. And the death of their close friend, it changed you, right? Made you think different, right? Maybe God needs to shake up some of you young people's world. Amen. He shook up my world. You've got to stop being so focused on the tangible realm that we live in. The tangible realm is not a reality because it's a temporary time frame. You don't step into reality until you step into eternity. This is nothing. And we get so focused and so consumed with the temporal things that we can't even think of supernatural and eternal things. That's what happens in this world. Would to God we would treat our Bibles like our cell phones and our televisions and our hobbies and our affairs. That we would invest all of our energy and our thoughts and our time and our meditation on the living word of God. I don't know what some of you are thinking. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his words, what? Shall live forever. Amen. This world means nothing. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you ought to meditate on it when? Day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. We're to meditate on the word of God. The Bible's to be the most important thing in our lives, our focal point. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. All the day. Do, you listen, guys, and every time you pick up that phone, you can't meditate on the Word of God. You can't do it. Our minds become so preoccupied that we literally lose focus. You've got to be focused on what is real. You've got to be focused on the supernatural God. Ephesians 4, 29, don't turn there. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and edifying and that which ministers grace unto the hearers. Could you imagine that if you live like that, that every word you spoke, every word that came out of your mouth was for the edifying and it was for ministry and it was for the glory of God. And you didn't grieve the Holy Spirit why be you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one toward another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. We get so consumed. Ephesians 5.16, the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 if ye then be risen with Christ listen to this seek those things which are what above you see that seek those things which are above if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God listen to this and set your affection your desires your passions your emotions set your affection on things that are above and not on the things of this earth Heaven and earth shall pass away, listen, with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Now, I know some of you think, oh, Pastor Mike, I got a long ways to go before that happens. Oh, yeah? Study the Bible. Study the Bible. Start spending hours in that Bible, and you're going to have a different train of thought. That's right. That's right. Set your affection on things above. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Everything you see in this world is a temporal state. But the things which are not seen, the supernatural realm, the spiritual realm, they are eternal. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, O Lord, because he trusteth in thee, and he trusteth in the Lord forever. For in the Lord, Jehovah, is everlasting strength. Now I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We have a, an awesome story here about what does it mean to stay focused. 
We can talk about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We can talk about how we need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can talk about all of these things, but we have to go into detail to see what it really means and how we can apply it directly to our lives. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 1. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with other besides the Ammonites, they came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Jehoshaphat is being surrounded. He's being under an attack. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side of Syria. And behold, they, they are beaten Hazaratha, uh, which is in Eglai. And Jehoshaphat, look at this, he feared and he set himself to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He sees the enemy coming against him. He's, a, he's afraid. He has to face this battle. He has to face a, an attack that literally outnumbers his own people. He's under this attack. He's filled with fear and worry. He's consumed with fear. Maybe he had some anxiety. Maybe he had some worry at this particular point, but he was filled with fear. And Jehoshaphat feared. He feared what he had seen. So what does he do? He set himself to seek the Lord. Guys, listen, when you're filled with fear and worry, you've got to set out to seek the Lord. Listen, guys, there, there's going to be some things that have happened in this world. And the only hope that you have is to cry out to God. Do you understand that? Listen, there is, listen, the only hope is to focus on God and to focus on his word because no one is going to be able to resolve any problems in this world except for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Th things are going to get worse, guys. We know that from the word of God. And what are we, what are we supposed to do? Set your affection on things above. We've got to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. He feared, right? And he set out in himself to seek the Lord. The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Listen, guys, we need to be crying out to the sovereign God of heaven on a regular basis because we're surrounded with adversity. We're surrounded with trial. We're surrounded with tribulation. You may say, Pastor Mike, everything in my life is going fine. Praise God, it's going fine right now. But tomorrow's coming. And every, your whole world can be turned around in a moment's time on the flip of a dime. And so what happens next? Verse 4, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So everyone's seeking God. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of, of Judah in Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new, the new, uh, the new court. Okay? So anytime you're overcome with fear and worry, and you're faced with adversity, trial, tribulation, seek God. That's the first thing we have to do in this world and in this life. Our focus is not on the problem or the trial or the tragedy, but it's to cry out to the sovereign God of heaven. Look at verse 6. This is what they said. And said, O Lord, God, our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? Now, I love the way he's uh, uh, approaching God here. He says, God, aren't you the God in heaven? Aren't you the one that does great things? Aren't you the sovereign one? Aren't you the one that has absolute power and absolute authority and has absolute control over everything? He said, O Lord God, our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? Now watch what it says, guys. And rulest not over all the what? <laughs> you guys get that? Who, who has the authority over the, king, over the heathens? Who? Who has authority over the United States? God. Who has authority over Jerusalem? God. Who has authority over the Palestine? God. Who has authority over Africa, uh, uh, Israel, Brazil? Who has authority over China? Who has authority over Russia? Who has absolute power and absolute authority? You have got to focus on who is in control. We get so caught up. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at this. And we lose sight of the sovereignty and the majesty of Almighty God who has everything under control. What do you think you're worried about? I just sit back and go, I'm just chilling, man. I just go like this. 
Oh, Pastor Mike, they're bombing this, they're bombing this. I go, cool, man. It all lines up with the scripture. You think I worry about it? I don't worry about it for a second. Some of you guys are sending me stuff. I don't even look at it. So don't bother sending me anything pertaining to that. You want to know why? Because the battle is not mine. You think you're going to suck me into this stuff? Oh, no. Listen, man, I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Hey, when Peter got out of the boat, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, what happened? He sank. You know what I'm going to do? I'm walking on water. You guys can focus on all this junk and get worried and get mad and get anxiety and get depressed and want to jump here and want to say this and do all that. Listen, you better knock that nonsense off and you better put your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our what? Of our faith. Amen. He wrote the story. Look at this, right? This is awesome, guys. Notice how he's praying. He's acknowledging the sovereignty of God. I, I, I'm not you God in heaven? And rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand, look at it says, say it out loud, is what? Is there not power and might so that none is able to what? You see what he says? God, in your hands is power and might and nobody can withstand anything. You are the sovereign one. You have absolute power, absolute control over everything. I think some Christians think like this. They go, oh no, God made the devil and he made a mistake. What is he going to do? He's got to fix it. Oh no, and God put Adam in the garden and Adam made a mistake and now God's got to fix it. Guys, you've got to understand something. This thing has already been mapped out in the sovereign knowledge of God. All right, let me explain something to you. Every detail has existed in the mind of God for all of eternity. Do you understand that? Some of you are like, oh. Like, let me explain this to you again. God doesn't come up with an idea. It was already. Do you understand that, guys? Nothing happens that takes God by surprise. He's sovereign over everything. God doesn't go, I slipped up and I made a mistake. Oh, no. What are we going to do with Russia? What are we going to do with Israel? What are we going to do with Palestine? What are we going to do? This pe person died. This person died. Oh, no. The, hell are, the airplanes are going to fly into, into the building, uh, uh, into the uh, Twin Towers. And it's going to, what are we going to do? How are we going to stop this? See how we think? It was all the providence of God. My Bible says he's making all things beautiful in his time. My Bible says he works all things together for the counsel of his own what? Of his own will. You say, God allowed, those, God allowed Hitler to kill millions of Jews? Yes. God allowed those planes to crash into that, those buildings? Yes. And everyone that died was under the sovereign providence hand of Almighty God. Once you think that God has lost control, you lose trust in who he is. That's when fear, worry, confusion, all these different mixed emotions come in you once you lose sight of who he is. That's what Peter did on the boat. We'll see that in a few. So Jehoshaphat, he's not just seeking God. What is he doing? He's acknowledging God's sovereignty. He's acknowledging his majesty and his power over everything. That's what he's doing. Look at verse 7 now. Verse 7. Ah, art not thou our God, who do, oh, look at this, who didst drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy, uh, thy people Israel and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever, and that dwelt therein and, and, uh, and have built thee a sanctuary thereon for thy name, say, saying, if when evil come, pay attention to this, when evil come upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, or stand before this house and in, the, in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold, the children of Ammon, and Moab, and Seir. Notice how many enemies they have. You have the children of Ammon, you have the children of the Moabites, and you have Seir. You have three enemies, okay? You and I, in this world, we have three enemies. You have the world, the flesh, and the devil. You have oppositions coming against you continually. Whom thou wouldest, 
uh, not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say now, I say how they reward us to come and cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to, in, to in, inherit. O Lord our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might, now watch this, we have no might against this what? Notice what he acknowledges. He acknowledges his inadequacy. He says, God, now watch, here's how this works, guys. If you don't acknowledge God's sovereignty, you cannot acknowledge God's, your, what, inadequacy. You see, in order for you to acknowledge your own inadequacy, that you and I have no power to do what? Anything, guys. Well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. You're not going to do anything. And you're not even supposed to do anything. He acknowledges that they're inadequate. He says, we, we can't do anything. We can't, we, Lord, we can't do anything. There's nothing we can do against this army that's coming against us. There's nothing we can do against the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's nothing you can do. You say, Pastor Mike, I want to make a difference in this world. You want to make a difference? Focus on Jesus. Amen. You, you, oh, I'm going to write to this person. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You know, forget it. Focus on Jesus the author and finisher of your faith. Stop looking at all the things that are going on. Stop watching the news. Stop looking at this. Stop worrying about that. Stop thinking this. Stop thinking that. Listen, God's in control. If somebody dies, it was under the hand of God. If somebody lives, it was under the hand of God. See how we start to think? We start to think that we have some sort of power. Guys, if you're thinking that you don't even know what you're thinking. You have no power. You have your free will, right? To either reject or to receive Jesus Christ. You have your own free will to turn your focus on Jesus Christ or to turn your attention to this world. And if you turn your attention on this world, it's going to affect the way you think and it's going to disrupt your faith and it's going to destroy the work of God in you. Notice what he does. He acknowledges the sovereignty of God, but he has to deal with their own inadequacy before they can really process everything that's happening here. You and I have no power over anything. When you truly understand God's sovereignty, this is when you truly understand and see your own inadequacies. You think you have power to do something? You have, guys, listen, God's got this whole thing under control. Stop worrying about it. Stop stressing about it. Stop thinking you're going to do something. Focus on God. Now notice what he says in here, the latter part of that verse, okay? Look at the, lat the latter part of verse, um, verse 12. He says, look at he says, right? He says, this great company comes against us, right? Neither uh, know we what to do. We don't, he's like, we don't even know what to do. Guys, that's where we, you don't know what to do. You don't know what God's doing. God brought these army against them for a reason. He says, well, God, we don't know what to do. Now notice what it says. But our, say it out loud. God, our eyes are upon you. I'm not looking at seeing what the enemy's going to do. I don't care about the flesh, the world, the devil. I don't care what's coming against me. I don't care what's going on in Israel, in Russia, in Germany. I don't care what's going on all around the world. I'm going to put my eyes on you. And listen, now here's where it gets good, guys. I'm looking to the creator of the universe. I'm looking to the sovereign one. I'm looking to the master of masters. I'm looking to the absolute one that has absolute power and absolute authority over everything. I'm going to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. The author, it means he wrote this story, guys. The story has already been written and played out. You and I are not going to change God's story. He's the author and finisher right. of our faith. Our eyes are upon thee. Lord, we're not going to worry about Ammon and Moab and the Seer. We're not going to worry about them. We're going to look to see what you're going to do. 
We're going to look and to see what your hand's going to do. We're going to look to see what your power and your authority is going to do. We're not going to look at anything else, but we're going to look at you. We're going to look at your majesty, your sovereignty, your glory, your power, your sovereignty over everything. That's where we're going to look. And once they did that, it changes everything. Changes everything. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, look at verse 13. Verse 13. In all Judah, they stood before the Lord with their little ones. They gathered their children together, their wives and their children. Then upon Jerezel, the, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, and the son of Jehel, and the, and the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, they came, now watch this, the spirit of the Lord, watch this, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. So the spirit literally possesses these guys. And he said, hearken all ye Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now God is telling them this, and thou Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, say it out loud everyone, be not, be not what? Afraid. See that? Nor dismayed. By reason of the great multitude, for the battle is who say it aloud? It's who's the battle belong to? Why do you think you're trying to do something? You think your inadequacy is going to make a difference in a battle that has already been played out? You see how crazy we are? Think about it. The sovereign God of heaven, the one who spoke the sun, the moon, the stars, everything in existence. The one who holds the, mo the molecules together. The one who holds the universe together with his sovereignty. And you think that you have to help him? Are you nuts? You think that your little input is going to make a difference in, in, a, in a script that has already been played out? You know what you're supposed to do? Just focus on him. That's it. That's it. Our eyes are upon me. Once they acknowledge God's sovereignty, his majesty, and his authority, and once they acknowledge their own inadequacy, now they understand that the battle belongs to who? It belongs to God. See, now they see God's sovereignty, his authority, his power. They understand their own inadequacy. Now they realize God tells them, hey, guys, the battle doesn't belong to you. The battle's mine. I'm going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'm fighting your battles. Guys, I don't want to fight myself because I know how inadequate I am. My thoughts, my emotions, everything. I am weak. God has already fought the battle for me. Everything you're seeing in this world right now, your input doesn't mean anything. You're supposed to focus on God and the finished work of God. When they say our eyes are upon me, it means God, in the middle of this conflict, in the middle of this adversity, in the middle of this trial, I'm looking to your power, your authority. I'm looking to receive strength and hope and insight from you. And as long as my eyes are on Jesus, I have understanding, I have knowledge, I have wisdom, I have peace. But once I take my eyes off of Jesus, just like Peter, we begin to what? Sink. It means to lose hope. It means to crash. It means to fall in despair. It means to be confused. It means to lose power. It means to lose strength and, and destitute. You just lose it. You got a lot of Christians, they're not focusing on Jesus. They're focusing on this, looking at this, looking at this war, looking at this conflict, looking at the enemy, looking at the adversity. And they're zoning on that. Their cell phones, brrr, pick up the Bible. Amen. Focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. I love how David puts it in Psalm. You don't need to turn there. Listen to this. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which, which made, listen, David says, who, the one who made heaven and earth. That's where my help comes from. My help comes from the designer, of the, the creator of the world. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. 
Psalm 123, 1 and, one and 2. Unto thee lift up my eyes, O, uh, o thou that dwellest in heavens. Behold, as the eyes of a servant look unto the hand of thy masters, e uh, and as the eyes of a maiden unto thy hand of, of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God. That in other words, just like you would look to your boss for direction, just like somebody, a woman would look to her mistress for guidance and counsel, we look to Lord. Our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until, watch this, until that we have found, that we have mercy upon us. Hebrews chapter 1, listen to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight. See that? Every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Watch this. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, the despising, the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Now let's turn, look at Chronicles again. Second Chronicles chapter 20, we're going to look at verse 16. So they are receiving commandment from the Lord. He says, to, uh, tomorrow go ye down against them. Go fight, you're going to deal with this battle. Right? Behold, they come up the cliff of, Z of Ziz. And ye shall find them, meaning the enemy, they're going to find the enemy at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jero. Ye shall not need to, here it is, ye shall not need to what? God's telling them, you don't need to fight this battle. Don't worry about it. I got it all under control. Set yourselves. And he tells them to what, people? You ever hear that? Be still and know that I am what? I am God. You know what that means? You just chill out, man. Shut the telephone off. Shut the TV off. And just chill. And know that he's what? And know that he's God. You just sit back and go, God's got this, man. The creator of the universe is controlling everything. Nobody can die without his hand. Nobody can live without his hand. Nobody can breathe without his hand. No, listen, he controls everything. Every moment, every second, every detail. The Bible says that a bird, a little sparrow, doesn't fall to the ground without your heavenly father. God is in control of every raindrop, every tidal wave, every thunderstorm, every tree that falls. Every branch that breaks, every animal you run over in the road, he's in control of everything. I know some of you are like, Pastor Mike, that can't be true. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And until you understand that, you're going to live in a crazy world filled with fear, anxiety, confusion, worry, until you focus on him, the author and finisher of our faith. The battle, he's look at God told him, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. He says, set yourself, stand still, and then he says, see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So he tells him, look, very clear what he tells him, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You know what you do? Just sit back and watch what God's going to do. Don't think you've got to put your hand into it. You don't have to. If you want to put your hand into it, you know what you do? You put your hands together and pray for it. That's what you do. You pray for the people that have to go through the suffering. And listen, and don't you dare not pray for the redemption of their soul that they be born again. Don't you ever pray for somebody's well-being and their health without praying for the eternal soul first. Don't you ever do that. Don't you ever try to help somebody and, and try to help them physically without giving them the truth of the gospel because you did nothing for them. Amen. Tells them, fear not. Don't be dismayed. Don't get worried. Tomorrow, go out against them for the Lord will be with you. Notice he says, we have the presence of Almighty God with us. How many of you guys have the Holy Spirit living in your heart? Put your hand up. Right? So Christ in you is the what? It's the hope of glory. Listen, guys. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's what? He's none of his. 
Guys, we don't have the presence of God just with us. We've got the presence of God where? In us. In us. We've got the presence of God in us. Look at verse 8. And Jehoshaphat, he bowed his head with his face to the ground in all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They fell before the Lord. I love this right here, right? So this is before the battles even fought. Now, all of a sudden, what are they doing? They're worshiping the Lord. Do you see that? And the Levites of the children of Israel, the Kohathites and the children of uh, the children of the Korites, uh, they stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. So here's his guys. See what's happening. You notice where their faith is. They've already trusted God. They're like, man, they're praising God. Praise, praise God. They're singing and they're praising God. The battle didn't even begin yet. You know what we need to do? Guys, we just need to praise God. God's got the whole thing. It's going to play out, guys. You know what to do? Just praise God. Amen. The Bible says in everything, give thanks, right? Praise God for everything, right? Just praise him for who he is. Praise him for his majesty, his holiness, his righteousness. Guys, we're supposed to be set out, focused on Jesus Christ, the author and finish of our faith, and we just praise God. Amen. Well, Pastor Mike, what happened when the towers were destroyed? Praise God. What about all those people that suffered and died and lost family members? Praise God. Because, listen, because the God I serve, he has every detail tied together. Okay? He's got this thing woven together that my finite mind could not even begin to process. And everything that happens is for his glory and for his purpose. Can I figure it out? Nope, but I'm going to trust him. Because I know he works all things together for what? For good to them that what love God who are called according to his purpose. You may be going through something in your life. Good. God's got you right where you need to be. You may have suffered some hurt and some pain in your life. Praise God. God uses those things to bring us to him. So they rose early in the morning, verse 20. They're praising God before anything even happens. I love that. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of, of Tokia. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Look at he tells them. Believe in the Lord your God. He says, Believe in God. So shall you be established. You see that? Just put your faith and trust in God. Believe what God's going to do. Believe God's going to fight this battle. Believe in his sovereignty. Believe in his authority. Believe in his majesty. Believe in his absolute power over everything. And then he tells them, believe his prophets, so you shall prosper. Notice that. As long as we believe, we prosper. Right? Prosper in what? Not being filled with fear, depression, anxiety, confusion. It's not prospering with money. Look at this. And when he hath consulted with the people, he, he, uh, they're appointed singers unto, unto the Lord. Look at this. And that, that should praise the beauty of what? You see that? Now pause right there. What are they praising, guys? His what? Do you ever, how many guys read in Revelation? Do you remember those creatures? Okay, you guys remember those creatures, right? What do they say? Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, and which is to come. In other words, God, you are holy. You have absolute power. You have absolute control. You have absolute authority. You are. You were, you, who is, which was. He's God of the past. He's God of the present. And he's God in the future. He's God. Crying out, praising the Lord for his holiness. Now watch this, right? Beauty and holiness. As they, look at this, as they went out before the army to, to, uh, to say praise, look at this, and, uh, and, and to say praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And when they begun to sing, watch this, right? And to praise the Lord, what did God do? Now, this, guys, this story is wild. 
I don't know how many is really know what happens here, but God, as they praying, right? God sends an uh, praising God. What does God do? Sends an ambush. Okay. So as they're praising God, that's when God begins to move. As they're trusting His sovereignty, His Majesty, His authority, and His power, that's when God shows up, and this is when God does His great work. Did you know Israel doesn't have to fight this battle? They've got three enemies, and other enemies were coming against Jerusalem. And you know what happens? This is wild, guys. God sends this ambush, and these enemies start fighting each other, and they kill each other. The Jews are just sitting back there like, whoa. They literally start fighting and killing each other. Now look at this, right? Look at verse 22. And when they had begun to sing... And to praise the Lord, the, uh, sing and praise, the Lord sent an ambush against the children of Ammon and Moab and, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab, they stood up against the inhabitants of who? Mount Seir, utterly to what? Slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone what? Whoa. You want to talk about God in control, man? God says, okay, you know what I'm going to do? Israel, you are completely inadequate. You can't do anything. But I'm going to show you what I can do. Those men went out there and they destroyed each other. They killed each other. Who do you think you are that you can put your hand to what God is doing? All they had to do, think about it, was to what? Focus, set their affection on things above, seek the Lord, cry out to him, trust him, his authority, his majesty, his power, and just sit back and watch God move. Sometimes, every time, you can't control anything that's happened in this world. Nothing. You can't, guys, listen, sometimes you just got to sit back, be still, and know that he's God. And when I say know that he's God, know his authority, his majesty, his sovereignty, his power. Know that he's the God that spoke the world into existence. That's the God we serve. The one who has the whole, he's the author and finisher. Everything's already been written out, guys. It's all been written out. They ended up destroying each other. Let's turn over to Matthew real quick and we'll end it with this. I've given you a couple quotes from this, but I just want us to look at this story. Now, this is an awesome story, guys. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. Now look at this. And when he had sent the multitudes away, Jesus sends the multitudes away. He went into the mountain apart to pray. Jesus goes up into the mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, if you know the story, Jesus tells the disciples, hey, guys, get in the boat and go over to the other side. I'll meet you there. They're like, what do you mean? You don't have a boat. How are you going to get there? He says, just do what I tell you to do. Yeah. Just get in the boat and just go. They say, okay, we, they get in the boat. They just go. Jesus says, I got something, man. I'm going to show them my glory now. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm going to whip up a big storm. Woo, 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 woo. The master of the universe whips up a major storm, right? I mean, man, the waves were rocking. The, it was thunder. It was lightning. And the disciples are out there and they're panicking. And Jesus says, I finally got him right where I want him because I'm going to reveal my glory. I'm going to reveal my majesty. I'm going to reveal my holiness. I'm going to reveal my sovereignty to them. So Jesus whips up a big storm. Now look at this. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, look at this, walking on the what? Who would say, whoa, wait a second. You know, these stupid Bible scholars, well, there was a bar there, and it's like a sandbar. It's like, shut up. <laughs> the master of the universe can walk on water. He's the one who spoke the ocean into existence. The people are so stupid. And when he, his disciples saw him walking on the water of the, of the sea, they were troubled, 
saying is, look at this, is it a spirit? And they cried out for fear. Now, here's the scary thing is they're so caught up with their own fears that they don't recognize Jesus. Stay with me, guys. Right. Did you hear what I said? They're so consumed with fear right now that they don't recognize Jesus. Did you hear what I said, guys? They're so consumed and clouded. Their eyes are so clouded with the rain and looking at the storm. They don't recognize Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, the creator of the universe, the designer of all things. They don't recognize him. That's, right. That's what happens when you get fearful and consumed with life. You don't even recognize Jesus. You don't recognize his authority, his majesty, and his holiness. You don't even see him for who he is. That's where they were. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Amen. What are you afraid of, guys? I know the master of the sea. And Peter answered and said, I love this, Lord, if thou bid me to come unto thee on the water. Jesus says, come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter walked on water. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Now Peter understands his own inadequacy because he loses his what? The focus on the sovereignty of God. So all of a sudden now he's like, oh, now he's afraid. Now fear, worry, and confusion sets in. Why? Because he lost sight of Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith. He lost sight of his authority and his majesty. Now he's afraid and consumed. Do you guys understand that? That's why so many Christians, oh, I need meds, and I'm, and they're, and oh, I got to do this, I got to do this. No. Focus on Jesus the author and finisher of your faith. Don't worry about anything. Just be still and see the salvation of the Lord. But when Peter saw the wind and the boisterous, he was afraid. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of what? Power, love, and of a sound mind. He began to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. Peter's going down. He's going down for the count because he lost sight of God's sovereignty, his authority, and his majesty. Once you turn away from Jesus and you start turning and looking to the things of this world, the adversities, the trials, the tribulations, the problems, everything that's happened in the world, everything, you will begin to sink. You will sink in despair. You will sink in confusion. You'll begin to sink. You'll go down. The word sink, it means to fall or, dro or drop slowly for lack of strength. Listen to what it means. It means to become depressed. It means to fail in health and in spiritual and emotional strength. Peter began to sink because he lost his focus. He was going down. My question to you today, where's your focus? Are you being distracted with everything in this world? Do you spend more time on your cell phone and on Facebook than God's book? Because if you are, you don't have the correct focus. You don't have the correct focus. Are you looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Where is your focus? Guys, you know what we're supposed to be doing right now? I'm not worried about what's happening all over this world in Jerusalem and Russia and, and all that. Listen, I'm not worried about it because I know the master of the universe. I know what God, God's going to do what he's going to do. I'm inadequate to do anything. But the creator of the universe does all things. We need to be looking to Jesus. That's it. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. Every time you reach for that cell phone, reach for your Bible. Can you do that? Say amen if you could do that. Amen. Every time you go to send a text somebody, right? Text them some scripture. Amen. 
Don't text them the nonsense. Don't text them the foolishness. Text them some scripture. When you want to post something, post the living, written word of God. The creator of the universe. The one who has this whole thing mapped out. The one who has every detail worked out. Turn to Hebrews 11. We'll end with this. Hebrews 11 verse 13. Hebrews 11 talks about the great hall of fame of faith. God's individuals, God's men and women that had great faith. Hebrews 11 verse 13, it says, These all died in faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And what is it, people? The evidence of things not seen. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having them, say it out loud, people, seeing them afar off. And they were persuaded of them, the what? The promises that were written in the word of God. And what did they do? Say it aloud. They embraced them. They embraced what God spoke to them. They embraced the promises of God. They embraced the sovereignty of God. They embraced the majesty of God. They embraced the holiness of God. They embraced it. Now I love this next part. And they confessed that they were what? Let's do this. Let's say this with me out loud. I'm just a stranger. I'm just a pilgrim. This world is not my home. And praise God for that, right? Thank God that this world is in my home. Thank God I don't have to live in this sin-cursed world, in this sin-cursed body forever. I can't wait for this corruptible to put on what? Incorruption. And this mortal to put on immortality. I can't wait. Some of you is like, but what about me? I want to grow up. Forget about it. <laughs> Trust me, when you get in the presence of God for that moment's time, man, and those former things are passed away, you'll never even think about this sin-cursed world ever again. Amen. Trust me on that. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now look at this, verse 14. For they that say such things, they clearly, plainly, Look at this, that they what? They seek a country. <laughs> hey, they're not seeking the United States. <laughs> they're not seeking, you know, Brazil. They're not seeking some other country uh, of South America, of some other South. They're not seeking that. You know what they're seeking? An eternal country. You know where their focus is? On an eternal presence and an eternal country. And truly, now what, here's the problem. And truly, if they had been mined from for the country from whence they came out, they might have opportunity to what? Stay with me, guys. Don't lose me. We're almost done. In other words, if, they went, if, if Abraham looked at the country that he came from, he might have been like, I want to go back there. My fa family's there. I want to go back. I want to go back. He might have went back. But you know what he did? He turned his back on it. Didn't Abraham turn his back on it? You remember Lot's wife, guys? You remember lo what happened to Lot's wife? Listen, Lot's wife was delivered. She was out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what did she do? Man, she turned back and looked back. She was turned into a pillar of salt. You remember what Jesus says? No man fit for the kingdom of God, having put his hand to the plow and what? Looking back. You can't look back, guys. You've got to focus on what God is doing. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, had they been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. If you stop looking at Jesus Christ, you're going to return back to this world. But now, present tense, but now they desire a what? A better country. That is what, guys? Heavenly. Heavenly wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their what? God. For he hath prepared for them a what? City. A city, guys. Let's bow our heads forward to prayer. Where do you stand? Are you worried, confused? Christian, you need to stop looking at the things in this world. Stop worrying about what's happening over the world. Stop worrying about this. Stop stressing out about that. Stop talking about this. You know, pray about it, and that's it. Don't think you can put your hands to anything. If you want to put your hand to something, put them together and pray. 
And don't you try to pray without praying for the redemption of souls and people being saved. Amen. Don't think you can make any help. The only help you can do is pray for somebody's redemption and the salvation of their soul. That their free will will be turned over to the very will of God. You have to realize your own inadequacy and in God's sovereignty, his majesty, and his power. I serve a God that nothing takes him by surprise. That he controls every aspect of human history. He controls everything. You are right where you are at in your life because God allowed things to come into your life. And God will take your mistakes, your sins, and your foolishness and he will use them for his glory and for his purpose. Because you know what God cares about? The souls of men, women, and boys and girls. That's all God cares about is the soul. It's the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profits nothing. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the word of God. And thank you for what the Bible teaches us and what it contains. We thank you that we serve a God that controls everything. All powerful. Has absolute authority over everything. We don't have to fight. We don't have to worry. We don't have to try to do this and try to do that. Just help us to be focused on you. Every time we pick up our phone, help us to pick up the Bible. Every time we go to send a text, help us to text people's scripture and help us to treat the very word of God more important than our cell phones and anything in this life. And Lord, we thank you for the breath of life. We thank you for the word of God. Thank you for everyone that's here this morning. Pray that you minister to their hearts. Help them to understand your sovereignty, your majesty, and your authority over everything. That nothing happens without your power. This is all part of your plan. The very author and finisher of our faith. The one who wrote the story from beginning to end. The creator, the designer of the universe. Help us never to lose sight of you. Help us, to, Lord, just to be still and know that you're God. Daily, help us to worship and praise you. And not get distracted but help us to be focused. Help us to press on to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Help us to stay focused on the word of God, on the glory of God, on the authority of God, on the holiness of God. Help us, Lord, to help our minds to be stayed upon thee, O Lord. Our hearts, our thoughts, our words, our actions, our emotions, help them constantly be turned to you. Our affection, help us to be turn, help it to be turned to you. And Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've done. We're gonna have a verse of invitation, right? Everyone, be still. Trisha's gonna play. No one's gonna move. If you need to come forward, the altar is open.